we need a foundational account, whether that foundational account is a matter-first account or that foundational account is a mind-first account. We need a foundational account, and thus um, the point. The point is that both the occultists, right, so that both and the theists, right, both the occultists and the theists believe this, right? You can't properly be said to be an occultist and not believe this. You have to believe this in the occultist. There, are, there is no sect of occultism that believes this. You can't be an occultist. Right? You can be a scientist. You, there are different types of scientists that you can be. But you can't properly be said to be an occultist and believe this. You can't. Right? So the thing that the occultists and the theists believe, right, of whatever religious denomination, monotheistic or polytheistic, believe is that it was mind at zero hour, then matter followed. The scientists believe no. This thing is the Big Bang, and it was matter, then mind, and even now they've reduced that to just matter. Okay, so that's important. The reason why I had to incorporate Aristotle's first principle, the uncaused cause, is because obviously that discourse, I'm saying Aristotle is not um, an occultist, but you can see how you can use Aristotle to make sense of this. You can't really get to this distinction unless you go through Aristotle's uncaused cause. It's a great way to sort of, pedagogically it's good, but it's also good for you to understand, just because it is. <laughs> All right, next quote. Um, another uh, point from Aristotle. Right, this is going to pertain to existence, and I'll raise the board in a second. We need to m make sense of the different forms of existence, because various forms of existence will play into theistic and occultist interpretations of reality. Obviously, reality is existence, and we need to talk, have an understanding, metaphysically, of the stuff that is reality, right? Um, and on a deeper level, sort of the ontological being in reality, which is a lot more complicated to talk about, and I'll just sort of traipse around that because that's too deep for YouTube. Um, but we need to have an understanding of reality. So here's a quote. I think this comes from Tufts again. So let me erase. And this will have to do with Aristotle's... He doesn't explicitly say this, but obviously it's in the text, and I've cited the text from uh, Tufts University's website page, and I've provided the link. The link is, link, uh, is footnote 43. So um, this, these are the three forms of. So these are the three forms of existence. Here's a quote from Aristotle. Quote: Closely connected with these questions is the problem whether the element exists potentially, or in some other sense. And for those of you who know what it means by potentially in Aristotle, this is sort of the acorn reference, right? So closely connected with the question is the problem whether the element exists potentially or in some other sense. If in some other sense there will be something else prior to the first principle, if it exists in some other sense, then there's something before the first principle. For the potentiality is prior to the actual cause, and the potentiality need not necessarily always become actual. Right? You can have an acorn that doesn't become an oak tree. You can just keep the acorn on your desk. Right? Um, on the other hand, if the element exists potentially, it is possible for nothing to exist. For even that which does not yet exist is capable of existing. Right? That's very important. And I'll go back and break this down a little bit uh, you know, in detail to make sure that it's explicitly clear, because I know that this is dense. Um, for even that which does not yet exist is capable of existing. That which does not exist may come to be. It doesn't exist, but it may come to be. But nothing which cannot exist comes to be. What in the world is Aristotle talking about, right? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get more cryptic than that. It's very simple. He's talking about three forms of existence. The first form of existence is what's actual. Actual. Actual existence is the first, in no particular order, but actual is the first form of existence. Um, let me see if I can find it. He doesn't, uh, um, for the potentiality is prior to the actual cause, right? That actual cause, that actual existence is actuality, is the actual world, right? I am the, if you think of it in this sense, I am the actualization of my parentage. My parents had a potential with them, within them, right? Man produces, you know, several billions, maybe trillions, maybe up some number I don't even know, of sperm throughout his or her lifetime. 
all of those potential, a, mo a, lot, a significant number of those sperms serve the potential to create an actual human being. I, as an actual human being, am the actualization, right? I am the actualization. I am the actualization of the potential within my uh, mother's ovaries, eggs, to be specific, and sperm donor's sperm, right? So you take mom's eggs, you take sperm donor's sperm, you put it together uh, in 1975, and ping, there you go. There you got Dr. Campbell, right? So I am the actualization of that potential. And here I am, right? I'm right here. You can't really see me, but, you know, I'm talking to you on YouTube. You know, you can come over here and just tap, tap, right? I'm here. Okay. So actual existence is pretty simple, right? Um, as, as many people know, philosophers love to debate whether or not actual existence actually exists, but I'm not going to get into that sort of Brooklyn, um, solipsistic, uh, idealistic metaphysics uh, at this point, right? So, yeah, stuff around me, actual existence. Next is potential, or non, potential or non-existence, and he says, for the potential, this is like midway through the, the citation, for the potential, in bold, for the potential is prior to the actual cause. And the potential need not necessarily become actual. Right? Um, so think of, think of it like this, before I give you the example. On the other hand, if the element exists potentially, it is possible for nothing to exist. So two parts. So I'll explain it. And that's the two parts of part two. There, there is no contradiction in the idea of the 50-foot woman, right? There's no contradiction in saying, imagine, hypothetically speaking, in this alternate universe that there existed a woman who was 50 feet tall. It's not my example. This is a traditional philosophical example. I don't know why it has to be the 50-foot woman, but you get the idea, right? So imagine in uh, an alternative reality, in an alternative universe, there existed a 50-foot woman. You say, okay, fine, sure. There's no contradiction in there being a 50-foot woman. Right? There's nothing inherently contradictory with being a 50-foot woman. So that, in a sense, that potential could be actualized one day. This is how science, in a sense, operates. Scientific, real good science, and also good, good social science, good theory, operates in a sense. What could be the case? It could be the case that um, uh, black boys and um, black girls get to go to school with white boys and white girls. Martin Luther King had this insane idea. Um, and it was a possibility. In his time, it wasn't, it, it, it didn't exist, right? And he fought in order to see that actualized, right? Um, so that he took the idea, in a sense, in the ethos, if you really want to start, now you can start to talk about occultist views, and I'm not saying Martin Luther King was an occultist, but just, there was a, he recognized that there was a potential. There's no contradiction in saying that there could be a state of affairs where black boys and black girls go to school, or white boys and white girls. And he recognized that there wasn't, that actual existence in reality. So he served as a vehicle, right? He served as a vehicle. If this is, and I would draw it like this, this is actuality, and here I am, and here's potentiality, right? And here are all the different things that are potential, and here is impossibility. Then what I recognize is first I have to differentiate between what's impossible and what's possible. And for those things that are possible, select something that is possible, right? And try to channel that possibility into the actual world, right? Use myself as a vehicle. Later, I'll, I'll actually want to talk about channeling and stuff. And it doesn't, I'm not saying that you have to be an occultist to do this, right? I'm just giving you an idea. But in a sense, loosely, not in the technical sense of channeling sort of channel that idea into existence, right? I, I want to create a condition in which, you know, the world is a better place, right? I'm going to, I, I, I think I can do this. Let me, let me see what I can do to make this world a better place, right? It's not currently the case, or I, I want to do, you know, I want to make sure young black boys and young black girls can go to school together. They currently can't. What can I do? And, okay, let's, you know, let's boycott, let's start marching, let's start, you know, petitioning, blah, 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 blah. Right? And that force, that drive that I have creates a condition in which I sort of pull the potential into the actual so that there's no longer that potential. It's now actual. So that's, that's the idea, right? So he says, 
for the potentiality is prior to the 